So Sophie is going to talk about um, lessons that she has learned over the past six years as a tech recruiter. Um, for those of you who don't know Sophie, she was a recruiter at two companies here in Champaign, first at Wolfram and then at Granular, and has made quite a name for herself as being one of the best in the business. And she decided to go out on her own and has created her own consulting company where she is taking the lessons that she's going to talk about today and is helping even more companies with that. So um, we appreciate Sophie being here. Um, she is also a quite the world traveler. So if you want to talk about uh, world travel, world traveling and running around lots of different places, um, Sophie is your gal. So she's a, quite a, um, adventuresome, but she has a lot of great knowledge and, um, and background that she's here to share with you today. So without further ado, please give a warm Research Park welcome for Sophie Roney. Hello, I'm Sophie. Um, Laura covered a lot of my background, um, maybe too kind. <laughs> Um, she mispronounced um, world travel, and I think you said uh, rural travel, and I also like that as well, though, too. I love a good small town in USA. Um, so this is a little bit about me. I grew up in Champaign-Urbana. I actually went to high school at Champaign Central. Did anybody else go to Central by chance here? No? Is anybody else from Champaign-Urbana here? Two people? Oh, wow. We have a lot of implants on um, so, that, I know the area well, I've lived here for a good amount of time. I have spent the past six years focusing on tech recruitment, and um, now I do own my own consulting company, and one of the reasons why I love recruiting and why I stay in this field is because the whole goal is to help someone improve upon their life in some way. And if a career, a positive career change can really do that for somebody, um, in a multitude of ways, and we'll, we'll go through that. So that's that's why I do what I do. I enjoy helping people make a positive improvement on their life. And then personally, these are some of my interests and a few photos from recent travels. Okay, so can anybody give me examples of an industry or a company that, that you think does recruiting really well? Is it silence because there isn't one, or because you're shy? Google. Pardon? Google. Google? Google. I don't know that company. Google. Google. Oh, Google. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Um, Google. Google actually has. She does. Kathy <laughs> does like a job of recruiting. She will have it a lot. She asks you if you're good at recruiting. <laughs> I'm good at recruiting. Masha's a great recruiter. Um, but I ask this question because it's, it's something that every single company in every industry struggles with. Um, you can put in a quick Google search and you can look at all the books right on the title, but if you feel like you don't have recruiting figured out, that's likely 99% of every other company and every other team. Um, it's really hard to get the science down for your company because it's so unique in terms of how do I create a process that will yield a really quality hire. Um, okay, so who in the company is responsible for recruiting out of these out of these options here? Who who owns it? Okay, raise your hand if you think that it is um, just the CEO. Not the CEO. Okay, hiring managers. Hiring managers. One, two, three. Yes, it's all of them. Thank you. It is a hundred percent all of them. And if you don't have everybody on board your life is going to be a lot harder when it comes to recruiting because you need all of these players engaging and selling candidates um, throughout the lifetime, really, of the company. If your goal is to grow or even to remain stable, if you're even just focusing on backfills, everyone has to be involved. Uh, and then the second question here, who prioritizes recruiting? Is it a different answer? So in my opinion, uh, the prioritization has to come from the leadership, the CEO and the leadership team. If they are not prioritizing and noting with their actions that recruiting is a priority for the organization, then as you trickle down the chain, you can't expect other people to 
add a, a significant value to their day in terms of recruitment. Um, so this is, has anybody read Zero to One? Peter Thiel's book? It's a, about startups. So this is one of my favorite quotes from that book. And it describes some of the breadth that recruiting touches in terms of it's part detective work, it's part sales. Um, you have to scrutinize an applicant's history. You need to understand their motives, the compatibility within your company, and then persuade them to join you. So it's this double sales where not only do you have to get the person to be interested in you, but then you have to get the company to be interested in that person. Uh, so it's it's not it's not super simple. When I actually first got into recruiting, I was a little bit hesitant because I thought like, oh, recruiting like at face value it seems kind of simple. I'm not sure if that's something that I want to dedicate my my career to. But really, when you dig into the details, which we will get into more today, there's a significant degree of um, so this doesn't help my business, but it's 100% true that recruiting should be a core competency of your company and it should not be outsourced. If you need help with building a process or if you need help finding a niche hire, great, but you should be developing your own internal processes so that you can continuously refine those so you have your own machine that produces quality hires. And someone else can't make that for you because every company is completely unique. Okay, so these are some common recruitment challenges, and that's what we'll be touching on today um, in terms of quantity or quality of applicants, a skills gap, so you're looking for a certain, say you're, this is a tech recruiting, so a senior software engineer with five years of Python experience, and you're just not seeing it. Uh, diversity. We also need to define diversity for a given company because it's not going to look the same in terms of what you're looking for. So if you haven't defined diversity for your company, consider doing that as a, as a takeaway from this conversation. Uh, time to hire. Is it just taking you a really long time? Uh, compensation. We can't pay enough compared to fill in company name here. The quality up higher, and then your offer acceptance rate. So maybe you have, you're getting people to the final stages, but they're not accepting offers. What's going on there? Any questions about this slide? And please feel free to raise your hand and ask questions, or else I won't know if you have them. Okay, so uh, what is technical recruitment versus other? Technical recruitment is typically the side of the company that does product development versus go-to-market recruiting, which would be uh, the part of the company that's responsible for selling or marketing the product. Uh, so the differences between there is going to be with technical recruitment, often you'll get GitHubs or Bitbucket, uh, Stack Overflows, or LinkedIn's, and you're not going to get a formal resume. Why is that? It's because we have a really low unemployment rate currently, and do I, I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room that software engineers specifically are in high demand. And so they don't have as much of an incentive to make themselves look wonderful on paper so that you can then pick them out of a pile and offer them a job. Uh, the interview process is a little bit different as well. So I went to U of I Business, I was taught in U of I Business that as soon as you go to a interview, you wear a suit, and this is how you present yourself communication-wise. Uh, that's not the same in the engineering realm. The engineering realm has a little bit of a, a different history. Speaking of Google, Larry Page and Sergey, they decided that they wanted to make everything informal. Instead of whining and dining, they were going to take people out to pizza in their hoodies and see how they function in that environment, which was more realistic to what they would experience on a day-to-day. -day. And the tech industry has, has evolved from that. And so if you judge somebody based off of what they wear into an interview because they're wearing jeans and a hoodie and you're expecting them to be in a suit, that might be on you. You can say in an email, we're in a formal or informal workplace. Um, so these are some of the differences. And then the communication style can be a little bit different. I found specifically with engineering candidates that um, it, the communication preference is more straightforward and blunt, and you want to get directly to answers instead of a little bit more um, circumvented conversation. 
Um, and then if, you, if you're curious about how an interview goes, because this is your first time or you're new in the technical versus go-to-market recruiting, just question your assumptions. So to put an example here, um, we, or I interviewed people where they didn't ask enough questions in the interview process. And the, it was like, well, are they really interested? They didn't ask these five things that you're supposed to ask about a company. Is this person really interested in joining us? I can't tell. And some companies will leave it at that. Like, well, I'm not really sure if they're really interested in us because they didn't, they didn't, they didn't have this standard that I was expecting. Um, if those scenarios arise, you can call the person and you can ask them directly, are you interested? I got the impression from you communicating in this way that you're not that interested. Is that true? And they might say, you know, actually, I took one of your engineers out to dinner the night before and I got every single question answered. I'm super interested in the company. I have all the questions that I need. And so there's, there's different communication styles. Um, as different types of people sometimes gravitate into these different buckets. Any questions based off of that? Do people here know how to read technical resumes? Is it worth pulling one up and, and looking and, and me describing what I see? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this one is of Aryan Danishwar. Ah, shucks. All right, Larry, you're up. <laughs> Larry's in the audience, he's unpoachable. Um, but uh, this is an example of a technical resume. I asked him to send this to me last night uh, because this might be helpful to see how I would look through a resume like this. So you can see that Larry lists um, in one of the first lines a bunch of different a bunch of different technical terms. So we have Node.js, React, Redux, um, SASSS, I actually don't know what that is, AWS, Postgres, Linux, Python, Bash, Docker, Git, GitLab, Latex. So if you're not technical, this might just seem like a ton of random words at the top of his resume. But what he's saying here is, I'm a front-end engineer because I know React and Redux. He's actually quite good. Shout out to Larry. Um, I, I've also done, I also do software as a service that can be hosted on a cloud because I know something called Amazon Web Services. You need to know the synonyms that go along with Amazon Web Services. So Azure would be a synonym of that. Um, I can also do some back end coding because I know Python and Docker. Um, and so these are some keywords that stand out that you need to familiarize yourself with. If you're looking at technical resumes, if you don't know those things, then you would have no idea that Larry could be a really strong front-end developer, just based off of this, front, this first line, a front-end developer that also knows um, how to do full-stack development. Um, then you see things like EC2 or S3. And um, if he didn't have AWS here, you might not know what that means. These are just... These are acronyms that are used in the computer science world, and these are both just services that AWS, Amazon Web Services, provides. And so when I'm recruiting and sourcing, I actually have a list of front-end, back-end, um, and then all the synonyms that it could mean to be a front-end engineer. So if I'm a front-end engineer, but I'm not explicitly going to say that, I am a front-end engineer, I think to myself, okay, what are the code names that I could then call myself? So I could say, I like JavaScript, I like um, React, I like Angular, I like Elixir. Uh, and then there's, along with each of those, they can call themselves other things. So who here knows what Kubernetes is? It's a new popular containerization technology. Um, Kubernetes can also be spelled K8. And if you saw K8 on a resume, and you didn't know that that also meant Kubernetes, then you're, you're missing out on these little clues. So when you're doing technical recruitment, if you don't know what all the synonyms are, and you're reading a resume, you could have somebody that does exactly what you're looking for, but you just wouldn't know it because you don't know that, that the source, per se. Another example of that, I'm looking for a Python engineer, but this person only has things like Pyramid and Flask on their resume. 
Pyramid and Flask are Python frameworks. And so they're telling you right there, I'm a Python engineer, but if you didn't know that Flask and Django are frameworks, then you have no idea that this person is a Python engineer. And because we live in a world where software engineers are high demand and low supply, software engineers aren't fighting to tell you that exactly what they do. You kind of have to figure it out based off of piecing together their LinkedIn, their GitHub, their Stack Overflow, and figure it out for yourself because they're not coming to you. Maybe you're lucky if you get some really good applicants from your job descriptions, but or else you have to be able to put together these pieces of the puzzle. That's where it's part of the tech work. Pardon? No, Larry's good. He was the best one out of the bunch anyways. Okay, let's put this back into presentation mode. Is there any questions based off of based off of that? The the resume example? Yeah. How, how do you build that glossary as a recruiter? Okay, so when I get a new requirement from a hiring manager, when I get a job description, I will literally go through and if it says we are looking for somebody with geospatial engineering experience, Python and um, they have to have big data. Big data is so big. So I will take those three things and I will literally list out every th single synonym and I, I'll just Google it and play like Wikipedia games for an hour for each one and piece together what you could, what could you call yourself if you're a big data engineer. Would, would Hadoop work? Would Apache work? Would big data pipeline work? Um, what are all the synonyms that plug into that space? If you're a geospatial engineer, what are all the geospatial libraries that exist that you might not say that on your resume or on your LinkedIn or on your GitHub, but it still says the same thing? So that's that's the beginning of my process. What I'm knowing about that is knowing those synonyms, and then and they're always changing, right? Um, Elixir is that what it's called? Elixir, the new one. Um, so that's like. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Yeah, um, that's one I didn't even know about until like last week, which is I think a new upcoming front end framework. Um, and so it's a you have to constantly be refreshing yourself on these things in order to to stay up to speed. Um, so thank you, Larry, for offering generously your resume. Any other questions before we move on? So assumptions play a huge role in this, and this is something I really struggled with, um, and I continue to, where you want to recruit somebody or you want somebody to join your company, but you might not even ask because you're like, oh, they're really well compensated at that company, like we could never match that. Or they have kids, they're probably not interested in the startup. Um, and these might not even be things that you say out loud, but you're, it stops you from ever even sending an email because you make assumptions about a person that potentially you've never met or you've seen once at Cafe Kobe. And so this is a really important part of recruitment of knowing that like you just have to ask someone and don't assume that they don't want to work in Python because they've worked in Java for the past 10 years. They could be dying to work in Python and could be doing side projects on the weekends that you have no idea about. And so one of the main things that I really had to challenge myself with is you you really just need to ask people and not assume on their behalf at all. Because I've been surprised at the people that will respond to my email and I'm floored. Like, what? Them? I thought they would never be interested in doing this type of work. Do any of you get pushed back for investment in recruiting from your companies at all? Or are you all on the same page? that recruitment, it makes sense to place time and value on it. Okay, well, if you don't, <laughs> this is a BCG study, um, and it just shows that if companies that know how to deliver on recruiting, they have um, three and a half times the revenue growth and two times the profit margin. And I have in the appendix more calculations that you can go into if you really need help convincing your company that you should invest in recruiting. More of this is one, and from a, a good source, people like BCG. Um, okay, so quantity and quality of applicants. Does, um, since we live in a talent scarcity 
environment, we need to take an active recruiting approach versus a passive. Uh, so a passive approach is when you post a job and you wait for people to apply. And that's basically it. And they do. And then you're like, great. Um, so tell me about yourself. And you don't have any type of a structure lined up to get to assess is this person a quality hire, not necessarily a quality interviewer, but will this person be a quality hire, a quality teammate? An active recruiting strategy takes a different approach, and um, you proactively think about what roles you need in the future, and you start literally seeking out those people in person, via email, over the phone. Um, if you have a recruiter, that's awesome. Um, if you don't, it's something that you should be thinking about as a hiring manager or a leader in your company. Of who, are, who are some of my dream candidates that I would love to have and how do I start building a relationship with them now? Um, how do I build an interview process that I can refine over time and make better and be able to analyze bottlenecks within that interview process so that we can improve our quality of hire or even know what our time to hire is? And then a referral program. Are you even leveraging the resources that you currently have in terms of your current employees, your investors? Um, do you have any type of incentivization for them? Um, investors is a big one. Do, what companies here have investors? Do any? Just one? Two? So investors are expecting a return on their investment, yes? And so they are incentivized to help you recruit because they want you to grow. They want you to do well, and you should be able to leverage them to help you recruit. A lot of VCs have this as a built-in function currently. Um, Anderson Horowitz kickstarted this where they have a recruiting team to help their companies recruit. However, if you have investors or university contacts and such, you can ask them for referrals. Who are the best people in this class? Um, who, are, who are the best product managers that you know? If you're looking for software engineers, sometimes the best people to ask are product managers because product managers know the software engineer as well or vice versa. Uh, questions on this one? Okay. <laughs> Who's ever had this thought that, man, what I'm looking for just does not exist, or I'm just not getting, um, I'm not getting any of the applicants, quality applicants that I'm looking for? So this is called the skills gap. That's like the trendy word for it. Um, so this is on you. If you have, if you can't. You need to do market research, essentially. So let's focus on Champaign-Urbana and the history of Champaign-Urbana. Um, if you're looking for mobile engineers here versus a back-end engineer, which one is there going to be a higher quantity of? Does anybody know? 100% uh, back-end, yes. This community, tech community, was, if you look at the history of it, we have the supercomputing, we have uh, Motorola, uh, these companies that founded the tech community here are these projects that are a plethora of backend engineers, Intel, before they left. And now those employees are in different companies within the community. Uh, and so you're going to have a much easier time of finding a backend engineer than you will a mobile engineer. Why is that? You can dig into that. You can do a little bit of research and just see what the numbers are. For mobile engineers, that's a technology that's been around 10 years. Can you really expect to find somebody with 10 years of experience or even five? React, which is a front-end framework that everybody wants a React engineer, Larry. Um, <laughs> he, this technology has been around five years. Some, I've seen job descriptions where you want six years of React experience. And like that does not exist. Has React been out six years? About now, yeah. Five, six years. <laughs> uh, but you have to think about those things when you're looking in the market, and then that'll help you determine uh, what your recruitment strategy should be. Do you need to get somebody to fresh out of school? Because that will they'll actually have mobile application experience. Um, do you need to relocate somebody from somewhere else? Should you consider people that are remote? So these are 
the research component is important when um, thinking about how you are going to fill a position that, that you need. Is there any questions based off of this slide? Okay, so what are you looking for? And this is a non-technical point of view, and I've highlighted what I think is the most important thing here, which is just a pattern of progression. Over time, is this person getting better? And you can ask that question in a lot of different ways, but that is what you're looking for. Are they gaining more responsibility? Are their projects getting harder? Um, and you can ask this question by, tell me how you got to where you are now. And then you ask questions along the way of, did you receive recognition for that? Oh, did you receive more um, responsibility in any way after that project? How did that project go? And you're, that's by and large one of the most important thing that I look for is that pattern of progression. And then there's the communication skills and leadership. Um, but the pattern of progression, I think, is, is what I ultimately look for when I <coughs> simply, if I'm scanning resumes pretty quickly. And the best part here for good people is good people always have multiple options. And so if you are taking a passive recruiting strategy now, you're likely not going to get the best people. Because even before they leave a job or something like that, they have options. So I won't go over every single thing on this slide, and I'm happy to send it out. But when there is a skills gap, so for example, there are more back-end engineers in Champaign Arena than there are mobile engineers. If you were to need mobile engineers soon, what could you do? You could build them, you could buy them, or you could borrow. Building is a coaching. You hire somebody that's more junior, and you allow them the time to learn in some capacity. Um, you could buy, you could relocate somebody. Um, you really have to do the research in terms of compensation and make sure that you're competitive, or you could borrow. You could do a, some type of a consulting agreement, and there's pros and cons of, of each bucket. Questions on this one? Diversity. Okay. Um, so this is, these are the top five computer science schools in 2016 and the gender diversity that they produced. So you can see that it's 77% male. So when you have diversity goals and you're like, man, I really want more women on our engineering team, you have to take a different strategy with that because it's, it's a numbers game from that point of view. If you put out a job posting, if you're just reflecting the market, 77% are going to be male. And so if you want to increase that, you have to be proactive in reaching out to the diversity demographic that you're looking for. And that's just knowing the numbers from that point of view. That's getting far better. This is in 2016 in the University of Illinois. Um, it's almost at 50-50 in terms of male-female at this point. Um, but these are going to be the people with three years of experience or five years of experience. So depending on the experience range that you're looking for, it's worth, it's worth knowing what the numbers are. Um, and then if you think about, if you're thinking about diversity in terms of ethnicity or race, the numbers again. Um, does your company visa sponsor? Can you visa sponsor? That will increase your ability to attract people that you consider to be what a, within your definition of diversity. So this is the biggest request that I get from companies is I want diverse hires. And then the first question I ask is, what is your definition of diversity? Uh, and then we go from there. Because I can't, I can't assume what diversity is for that people. In the first slide, the examples were socioeconomic, um, racial, gender, but it also could be ideolo ideology. Um, they just think differently than maybe some of the other people they have. They're not from the University of Illinois. All of our grads are from the University of Illinois. Questions based off of that? Okay, so um, your time to hire. Most companies well, might not even know what their time to hire is for a given role. So to give you an idea, a good time to hire is 40 days. Like, that's really good. 
So, if you put out a job posting, and two months later you haven't made a hire, and you're like, ugh, recruiting. <laughs> like, one, that's not that bad, that's like everyone. Um, but two, like, you need to even know what your time to hire is so you know if you're getting better. And then a good recruiting process, you'll know what these numbers are. So that when you have applications, all the way down to getting something filled, if you know your converted ratios, that's how you start to improve your core competency of interviewing, is by refining those percentages to what makes sense. So if you have a 75% offer acceptance rate, that means that you need even more people at the top of the funnel than if you have a 90% acceptance rate. Um, and so when you, when you get good at recruiting, you start to refine and refine these numbers so that um, your process is actually efficient and you can see what goes wrong. So another example would be uh, from interview to offers extended 18%, like that's so low. You would really need to look into that. Interview to offers extended 18%. So 18% of the people you bring in, you're not offering. That's a shit ton of engineering time interviewing. And you're only offering, or in, only 18% of those people are getting offers, what the heck is going on? So that's a number that you would really want to look into. Like, what are your interviewers asking? Are they asking them even the right questions? Do, do they know if that person's a good hire? Are they going off of their gut? Or something like, that can be a really good cop-out. And in, in an interview process, when you say, oh, why did, like, what do you think about candidate X? And the person's like, uh, you know, um, I, I'm just going with my gut on this one and it's a no hire for me. Never accept that. That is a sucky answer. It gives you zero information and um, it gives you zero insight into how that person interviewed uh, the, the candidate and how you can improve in, in, the, in the future. So that's something to, to pay attention to once you have a, a, an interview process. Questions? <laughs> Any questions so far? Oh, this one is my favorite. Okay, compensation. Uh, does anybody here know Tim Urban? The blogger, Tim Urban? Okay, so he, he wrote this, this beautiful chart here. And um, in the red is your career. So I don't, but this is other parts of your life. We actually probably go a little bit deeper into retirement working nowadays. Uh, but that's your career. That's how much time you spend in your career. So if you think people are only interested in money as a good reason to make a, a job move, you're wrong. There's a lot of other reasons why somebody would make a job move. Uh, and if you have no room in terms of what you can offer somebody from a salary point of view, you have other options. You do. For example, you can offer them time. So there's a new company in town that's doing four-day work weeks. Do you think that that would be attractive? Do you think somebody might take a lower salary if they, have, if they were working four days a week? Maybe. Yeah. Um, what if you didn't have meetings on Monday? You knew that Sunday was like actually yours. You didn't have to prep for an 8 a.m. Monday meeting. That's like, these matter. People care about their time. People are not as shallow as you think. <laughs> they like their time. Um, and so there's a lot of creative ways. These are only four examples that you can play with time. But, um, but this also increases your tenure at your company. Do you think people are slightly happier if, um, and, and feel a loyalty to the company if you get a salary and you work four days a week? Or you get a sabbatical for working there for three months or for three years? Three months would be wild. Three years. Um, that's what makes a difference. Um, transparency. So a lot of companies that I've worked with and I have friends that work with, um, Google is getting better at this. Um, is compensation philosophy how and why? Um, how do I even know what I'm doing and how do I get to the next level? Um, software engineering is, in my opinion, kind of inf infamous for um, really strange titles sometimes. So even in Champaign-Urbana, we have staff engineer, principal engineer, senior principal, staff engineer, technical engineer, 
technical staff engineer. Uh, you, the list goes on. I'm a programmer, I'm a developer. So what is it at your company and how do you get to the next level is something to identify like in the interview process. Uh, and how do the compensation ranges matter there? Like if you're going to bring me in at 90K and I know that I, I would like to progress financially, um, what's it, what does it take for me to get to the next mark of 110 or something like that? And then if you're offering equity, you have to be crystal clear about what that equity means. How many people offer equity or um, have a, a equity as part of the compensation package? Maybe you don't want to raise your hand, but that's okay. If you do, you have to be super clear about what that means in terms of um, when do I get the equity and um, what percentage of that is that. That's a huge point of trust that you, you, you can't break within the interview process in terms of what that equity means because that person is taking a lower salary, hence a risk, for equity to join your company. And if you're not crystal clear about what that equity potential is and how it will work, what happens if we're bought, what happens if um, we IPO, what happens if I lead the company in two and a half years, you have to, you have to be really clear. Uh, any questions based off of this so far? If you don't know Tim Urban, he's awesome. He does some really great infographics like this about um, quantifying kind of abstract things like how much time you spend in your career. Okay, um, so to produce a quality of hire, there are two components, the candidate experience and then just constructing the interview process itself. Um, one of the biggest ones is respect of time. So the candidate experience should be equal in terms of the company is spending X amount of time on you and you're spending X amount of time on the company. A great way to erode trust early on is to ask somebody to do an eight hour take home test and get back to them two weeks later about the results of that take home test. They spend eight hours on it, you take your time and get back to them, uh, you spend maybe an hour, um, that's, that starts an erosion of trust. Um, in a talent scarcity world, which we again live in, the interview process needs to be flexible. These people are arguably already employed and they might not be able to come in on a Tuesday for a full day interview. So how can you make your process slightly more flexible? Uh, and then um, some interview process rules of thumb. Are there any questions based off of this slide? Has anybody been rejected from a job? I have. Um, there's a right way to reject people in a wrong way, um, especially if there's future interest in that person. So I don't need to go over every single detail of this, but if you've met the person face to face, they deserve at least a phone call. They deserve a phone call letting them know that they, they didn't get the job. I mean, they just considered completely changing their life to join your company um, and spent a day maybe to PTO, they can get a call that says, you know, thank you so much. We're looking for somebody slightly, slightly more senior. Um, we expect to hire that person in about two months. We'd really love to keep in touch with you as we think you'd be a great second hire after we get that, that higher level engineer. Um, and I've done that a ton where you, that person is not a good fit right now, but you can still keep the door open in terms of um, having a future relationship. Is there any questions based off of this? And this is a really good way to leave a bad taste in someone's mouth about your company as well, um, especially in a small community of Champaign-Urbana. If somebody comes on site, spends an entire day with your company, and then they get an email for, I don't know, look, a week later, thanks so much, um, we decided to go with somebody else, or we decided to pursue other candidates, Candy email response. Um, that that that's a really poor candidate experience. Like that sucks. That person is not going to want to consider the company in the future, and probably not recommend it to their friends. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. So this one is, um, this is tricky. So if you are struggling or want more, a higher offer acceptance rate, um, this is about selling and it's about storytelling about your company. So I can't tell you what the right answers are because this is what's very specific to you. I can tell you what the wrong answers are about why I should join your company. It's because you are going to get to work with the smartest people. It's because we have free food. It's because we have yoga. It's because um, we work on some really interesting problems. Every single company says that. Those are not the right answers, and that's not what is going to put somebody over the edge. What will put somebody over the edge is something that's specific to your team, your mission, and your in industry. Why are you at the right place at the right time? And why does that person's personality fit into your team? Why are they going to be slightly better off by coming into work every day as a human being? And so if you don't have these questions in blue answered for your company, that's another good takeaway of knowing why somebody should join your company. And if, <laughs> and if you've ever said these answers, that's okay, because I've totally said them. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it's very common. But if you want to get better at selling, you want to increase your offer acceptance rate, then you need to move into the blue. Are there questions here? Okay. Uh, Tim Irvin again. I'm mean, you can tell I'm kind of a, a fan of his. So when you're able to tell a story, it makes a much bigger impact into the recruiting process and um, and into someone's memory of of their experience of of your company. So um, for example, I get asked all the time, oh, what is what's the tech stack? of the company, and one answer could be uh, Postgres, Python, JavaScript, and React. Perfectly fine answer to the question. Or I could say, ah, thank you for asking. We're an early stage company and we're actually still figuring that out. For example, last week we had an all hands meeting where Randy from engineering um, put together a slide of the pros and cons of React and Angular, and because Angular is moving to a different version soon and we think that React will be more stable, we've decided to go with React, and that was the decision based off of an 80% vote of the team. That provides a little bit more color into how the company makes decisions, and Randy, as an engineer, um, the communication style that this company opens those decisions up for debate. It's not coming from the top down. We are using this technology. So that's one example where you have the opportunity to add some color about your culture and about your team that you can miss. It takes a little bit longer, but every, every question that you get about your company is an opportunity to provide a little bit of color about the people that work there and the, hum the human part of it. Um, this is a group of people that you're going to work with that will literally change your lives by knowing them. They, they become who you spend the most time with throughout the week. Um, so this is an example of one of my favorite metaphors when Tim Urban is describing why SpaceX is so interesting um, and why what Elon Musk is doing is, is so relevant is because imagine that just a 747, every time it wanted to land, it just crashed and burned, and that's how we did it. And before, that's how it was done. We were just, rockets were being completely destroyed. And so Tim Urban says that very simply in an analogy, which are great in the recruiting process because you're describing technologies that are pretty complex, and it's helpful to be able to say, to break it down and say, it's a pet peeve of mine when we say we are the Uber for healthcare or we are the Uber for this, but it is effective. So figure out what metaphors and analogies work to get your mission or your technology across easily. Any questions based off of that? Okay, almost last slide. So even before money comes into the picture at all, you need to be offering somebody 
a 30% solution. So this is, there's a, a guy named Lou Adler, and this is his model, but he's, a, he's kind of famous in the recruiting world. And this is his formula, where if you're not providing somebody the opportunity to stretch themselves in terms of you get to learn this new skill set, you get to work with um, this type of new technology, your job satisfaction is going to go up because I know that you're super interested in healthcare and you're currently working in education. And you, you're, I know a part of your heart is invested in healthcare. Um, when you work for us, not only can you do this now, but in a year, this is where we'll be and that's where you can go. This is your launch pad, it's not just a job. And so you need to think about, are we, can I offer this person the 30%? And back to one of the previous slides, don't assume for them, just ask them. Like what would, what, what do you not currently have that you're looking for? What could make you like slightly more, so hypothetically, sir, ma'am, if, if there were something that could make you happy in your job, what would it be? Like no pressure, it's just a hypothetical question. Have you thought about it? And so that's what you're looking for even before you bring uh, money and compensation um, in, in, into the picture. Ah, the matrix. Does anybody know this photo? Yeah, nice. Um, you have to tell the truth <laughs> in the interview process. Like, this is a revelation, but if they accept the offer, they're going to come to work and they're going to find out the truth anyways in a matter of one to six months. And people have BS detectors, they can tell when they're telling the truth. And it's really important for the company as well to give an honest portrayal of the role and, and the future that they see of the company so that this is a good mutual long-term relationship. You don't want a situation where you just really need a hire and you, need, you just need somebody to help you to build this tool. Um, don't fall for like the short hanging fruit because a, a bad hire is super expensive. I have that formula actually later on in the appendix. Um, recruiting is all about relationships and, uh, and, and this person will eventually find out the truth. So lead with the truth in the beginning and that's how you also make sure that you get quality hires because they're going off of the actual reality of the situation, not a characterization or, or a romanticized version of the job. Any questions based off of that? Ah, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, just remember what it's like to interview. It's really tricky. Like, you go in and you meet people that you've never met before. You're trying to figure out the <laughs> the right answers to, to questions. Um, you're, you're interviewing the company as much as you're being interviewed. Sometimes there's pressure in the situation, um, especially in technical interviews. And so just remember what that is like when you're, when you're considering making a career move and what that means not only in the setting of an interview, but also like that person is considering making a complete life change to join your company. Um, that might be the amount of time that they spend with their family or or where they live. These are these are really big decisions, and so just remember um, that it's that it's challenging. Has anybody interviewed recently? Maybe <laughs> one person. Um, does anybody here really like interviewing? Nice, one person too. Um, I actually really like interviewing, but um, but it but it is challenging, and so just remember that because I feel sometimes nerves are part of an interview process, and that doesn't mean that somebody is a bad hire or they wouldn't do a good job. It means that they get nervous interviewing, and it's not the same as not being a good employee or a coworker. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions that I can answer? Kim? Um, do you know why um, many companies aren't doing sponsorships? It seems like um, 
if uh, some of the companies opened up to accept, you know, OPT, uh, there would be a bigger pool of candidates, but I find that some companies will not be responsible. I know two off the top of my head. One is if they do any type of government contract work, when sponsorship becomes a little bit more tricky, um, sponsorship can be very expensive, especially for startups. Um, and the legislation is getting slightly more tricky as well. Um, and then the e-verification process for a company, whether they decide to go that route or not, uh, makes a difference in terms of if they are capable of sponsoring. So those are the three that I know off the top of my head. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. The question was, um, why would companies be reluctant to sponsor? Yeah. Paraphrasing. Sponsor um, foreign visas or sponsor foreign employees. Are there any other questions? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much.